Welcome back to our series on malicious shellcode analysis. In earlier videos, we tackled how to extract shellcode from multi-stage malware. But today we're answering a critical question. What is the first step you should take to analyze it? Well, we'll start off by diving into static analysis techniques, starting with string extraction and pattern matching. So here on my desktop, I have two executables from earlier parts of this series, syswow.exe and mount.exe. Alongside these, I have the corresponding shellcode we extracted, as well as a new shellcode file named sc.bin that I'll introduce in just a moment. In parts one and two, we loaded the shellcode files into Binary Ninja to confirm that we had in fact dumped shellcode. But in my opinion, before diving into code analysis, it's important to start with some simpler techniques. And one of the first steps I perform during malware analysis is extracting strings. Now, I know what you're thinking. Did I really just click on a video about analyzing strings? Well, yes and no, but just bear with me. In part one, we casually browsed strings in the x64 debug hex dump as a sanity check before extracting shellcode. Now that works for smaller files, but with larger dumps like those containing embedded executables, viewing a hex dump quickly becomes inefficient. This is where a strings utility comes in handy. And on Windows, my go-to tool is the sysinternals strings utility available from Microsoft. So if I go ahead and open up a command prompt, I can use this strings utility in order to go ahead and view strings that were embedded in some of the shellcode that we extracted earlier. So for example, I'll type strings64, which is the name of the Microsoft strings utility. Then I'll do a dash no banner to go ahead and suppress some of that banner and copyright information that prints out by default. Then I'll go ahead and find the binary file here. This is the shellcode we dumped earlier. And then now I'll go ahead and pipe this to more so that we can page through the results. And then I'll hit enter. Now the results here are pretty straightforward. You can see, for example, on this first page that we see a reference to WinINet, which is a string that we did see in X64 debug when we were viewing uh, strings in the dump window. If I go ahead and hit spacebar here, I go to the last page, the final page here of results, and we see a reference to the same user agent string that we had seen in earlier videos in this series, as well as the IP address. Now, these are pretty easy to spot here because the file is so small, but in larger dumps, we could miss critical strings hidden among this noise. So to address this, I like to combine string 64 with another tool called string sifter. String Sifter is an open source tool that prioritizes strings based on their relevance for malware analysis. After a simple install via pip, String Sifter provides two important scripts. The first is called Flare Strings, which is similar to the sysinternal strings utility that I just showed you. The second is Rank Strings, which uses a machine learning model to rank strings by importance. Let's go ahead and see these tools in action. So if I wanted to use String Sifter in order to prioritize the strings that we just looked at embedded in syswow shellcode, I'd run the following command. I'll do an up arrow here to basically get the previous command I ran. And I'm going to pipe this to rank strings and then pipe this to more. As you can see here, the output shows me the most important strings first. So I have this IP address, the user agent string, and a reference to WinINet at the very top, just to be sure that I don't miss it. Hey everyone, just a brief interruption here. Do you ever struggle to define your malware analysis process or wonder where to keep your notes? You're definitely not alone. A ton of my students bring this up. So I put together a simple template I personally use when analyzing Windows executables. Click the link in the description and I'll send it straight to your inbox. And since it's a Google Doc, you'll always have the latest version. I'm also exploring some new ways to support your malware analysis journey. So let me know what you think and uh, enjoy the rest of the video. So we've just now discussed how to extract and prioritize ASCII and Unicode strings embedded within malware, but the truth is that malware authors know this is a common analysis technique. So to make our lives harder, they often obfuscate strings to hide important data, like C2 URLs, API names, and file paths. That's where tools like Mandiant's Floss come in. Floss is a game changer because it uses emulation to help us uncover encoded or dynamically constructed strings. Strings that can give us insight into the malware's functionality and behavior. So Floss is one of my go-to tools for an initial look at obfuscated strings, but keep in mind, it's just a starting point. It won't necessarily decode everything, and you may need to dive deeper into the code later on, fully understand any deobfuscation functions and the resulting strings. So let's say we want to deobfuscate any strings embedded in the syswow.exe shellcode. The command to run is the following. 
go ahead and exit out of this and clear my screen. And then I'll type floss followed by a dash F to specify the format, which in this case is gonna be 64-bit shellcode. Then I do a dash dash no static followed by another dash dash and then the actual shellcode file. So I already mentioned that the dash F, the whole point there is to specify 64-bit shellcode. The dash dash no static indicates I don't want to view ASCII and Unicode strings, only stack strings and other decoded strings because we already looked at the embedded ASCII and Unicode strings. And then this final dash dash is basically an end of options marker indicating that what comes next is a positional argument, basically the file name and not a command line option. If I go ahead and hit enter here, now it did print out quite a bit of information up top. If I just scroll up, you'll see it's just showing the work that is performing, but the results are ultimately down here at the bottom where I already was. Unfortunately, Floss doesn't really uncover any new strings for us. We already were aware of the embedded win inet strings. And we could go ahead and try this against the shellcode extracted from mount.exe. But unfortunately, in that case, it also doesn't give us any additional useful information. Now, this does suggest that these shellcode samples either don't contain obfuscated strings or they rely on more advanced obfuscation techniques that require deeper analysis. So that is a useful takeaway from having tried this tool against both of these dumped shellcode files. Now, I do wanna demonstrate an example where Floss does uncover some encoded strings. I have another shellcode sample on my desktop. I mentioned it earlier called sc.bin. Let's go ahead and run Floss against that 32-bit shellcode to see what it is able to uncover. So let me go ahead and clear my screen here again. And I'll now type Floss, dash F followed by SC32 because this is 32-bit shellcode. I'm gonna do a dash V, the verbose option, which will provide some additional context around any findings. And then again, I'm gonna do a no static since we don't care uh, at this point at least about the uh, embedded clear text strings. I'm more interested in any obfuscated strings. And then we need that end of file marker followed by the actual file name. I'll hit enter now. And here's where Floss shines. So you can see it identifies several tight strings, which is a type of stack string, uh, which is decoded on the stack. Now, among the results, we see references to several, for example, DLLs that malware commonly uses for network communications. And because I added that dash V, the verbose option, the results also include, for example, this function column, which specifies the address of the relevant function that's actually constructing the string. And then we also have the function offset column, which pinpoints the instructions responsible for actually creating the stack string. Now, both of these, of course, are addresses here, and it's important to know that they are relative to the base address, which if I go ahead and scroll up, I can see that the image base specified here is hex 690000. So what you can do is now load this shellcode into Binary Ninja, make sure you specify this particular base address, and then you can jump to the addresses that are referenced below in order to get more information on the code responsible for deobfuscation. For example, if I wanna investigate the code responsible for deobfuscating urlmon.dll, uh, what I can do is go ahead and copy this function offset address. So I'll go ahead and copy that right now. And then I'll go ahead and load Binary Ninja. So I'll drag and drop sc.bin into Binary Ninja here. Now here with the options, there are a couple of things I wanna specify. First of all, we just discussed the image base address. Uh, I know that Floss is presenting me with addresses using the image base of hex 690000. So I'm gonna specify that here. And then I know this is 32-bit Windows shellcode. So I'm gonna go ahead and find Windows x86 and then press open. Go ahead and maximize my window here. And for today, we'll focus on the disassembly. And now once I arrive here, I can type G on my keyboard to jump to an address. I'll go ahead and paste that address that I had copied earlier and hit accept. If I press spacebar, I can see that it brings me to this move instruction right here. And based on these arrows, you can see that this is the beginning of a loop. Now immediately above this loop, you'll see a series of moves right here. And these moves are basically taking encoded values right here, placing them onto the stack and then this loop is going to be responsible for actually uh, processing those encoded values that have been moved onto the stack and then decoding them into, in this case, urlmon.dll. Now, if you're looking for a script to help automate the process of adding decoded strings as comments within the Binary Ninja interface, 
check out the Python script called render binja import script, uh, which is located in the Mandiant Floss repo on GitHub. Based on some initial testing, it needs a few updates to get it working, but it's a solid starting point. And by the way, drop me a comment if you'd like me to dive deeper into uh, this script in a future video. So by leveraging Floss, we've gone beyond simple embedded strings and uncovered dynamically created ones that might otherwise have been missed. So we've discussed extracting, prioritizing, and decoding strings. Now let's shift gears to matching strings, which is another powerful technique in static analysis. What I mean by matching strings is identifying strings in our shellcode that are known to be associated with specific malware families or malicious functionality. This helps us better understand what the malware might be related to and what capabilities it might have. One of the most popular tools for strings matching is Yara. You've probably heard of Yara before. It's basically a tool developed to help malware analysts identify, classify, and group malware based on the presence of specific text or hexadecimal strings. These strings are placed into rules, which are then run against files on disk or content in memory to identify any matches. While writing YAR rules is an important output of malware analysis, for now we're going to focus on running existing rules against our shellcode to see if we can identify any matches that shed some light on the malware family or functionality. There are quite a few publicly available YAR rule sets out there that can help with this task. One of the best resources I have found is the awesome Yara GitHub repo, which compiles a variety of Yara tools, resources, and of course, rules. The list of rules there can be honestly a bit overwhelming, but if you're looking for a solid starting point, Yara Forge is a fantastic option. Yara Forge is created and maintained by Florian Roth. If you've heard of Yara, you've likely heard of Florian Roth. He's very well known for his high quality YAR rules and many contributions to the cybersecurity community. YAR Forge provides a well-maintained and high quality set of rules, and it includes three rule sets, core, extended, and full, with the last one being a comprehensive rule set with thousands of rules for various malware families. I've already downloaded it, and the full rule set, when you go ahead and unzip it, which I have here on my desktop, is called yarrulesfull.yar. So let's dive into running Yara with this rule set on our sample files to see what matches we get. And just for comparison, we'll start by running the rule set against our executable files. So to go ahead and run Yara against some of the executable files that we've uh, collected during this series, I'll go ahead and type Yara64, followed by the Yara rule set, which is Yara rules full dot Yara. And then I'll specify, let's start off with syswile.exe and hit enter. Now, unfortunately, the lack of output means there are no matches for this file. Let's go ahead and also try mount.exe. Again, no matches here, but that's not really surprising. When you extract additional stages of execution, as we did with these executables, it often means the initial layer includes obfuscation, which reduces the likelihood of signature matches. Now, let's run the rule set against the shellcode we extracted from both of these executables. First, let's try the shellcode we extracted from syswile.exe. Okay, so here we get some interesting results. Several rules match, and they suggest that we're dealing with either Metasploit or Cobalt Strike. If we want more detail on a specific match, we can look through manually the .yar file, but alternatively, I could also add a dash s here to provide a bit more context around the hits. So I'll hit enter again. And now we see some additional details about these matches. For example, the offsets where they occur within the file, and then these specific bytes that are actually part of the rule that matched. Let's try this also against our mount.exe shellcode that we extracted. This time, I'm not going to include the dash s because there happens to be many, many matches for these rules. And now we can see hits on two of the rules both of which suggest that this is Emotet shellcode, which is a malware family you've probably heard of before because it's well known for its modularity and its use in large scale spam campaigns. And by the way, running YAR rules against our shellcode highlights a key advantage of extracting those multiple stages of execution. Each stage provides additional content that can be analyzed with both public or custom rules, helping us uncover more details about the malware's type and the family. Well, that wraps up today's video. We started the static analysis of our shellcode by extracting and prioritizing strings, exploring obfuscated data, and identifying overlap with known malware families. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that thumbs up and stay tuned for part four 
where we'll explore some more advanced static analysis techniques. See you next time.